Great to get you safely. I left Cape Town at 10 o'clock this morning on time, and you never know what's going to happen with SAA and the weather and everything, but we got you all right, which was better than getting down there. Um, for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon, I thought it was time to look at a completely new lecture and to look at, in the, look at it all in the context of what's happening to our customer, the parents, and to see where do I think we are going with schools and education over the next 10 years, in particular what I refer to as private school education. And it's an offbeat, crazy presentation, but in the end, I think I quite like it. We start off looking at the generations. So, put a time scale up and you go, start with Generation Jones, pre-war. That's followed by the baby boomer generation. And then we got Generation X. Generation Y, who some refer to as the millennials. And we are currently looking at Generation Z, or the silent generation. That's because the kids just sit on their cell phones all day and text each other. We don't even talk to each other. And that is supposed to go on for um, 20 years. But the question that I'm asking is, can we wait that long? And shouldn't we be announcing a new generation right now? Because there are some major changes that have come along. So let's add the personalities to it. So we can put Churchill on Generation Jones, Elvis on the Baby Boomers, Mick Jagger on Generation X, Michael Jackson um, on Y, Bill Gates on Z, and have your guesses as to, to who I'm going to put going forward. If one puts it in, goes now and looks at what your consumers spent their money on, very important. They didn't have much to spend it on in Generation Jones. You bought your food, you paid for your education, you used public transport, and then we had keeping up with the Joneses, which might be Royal Dalton China or a new suit. Not much more than that. In the baby boomer generation, we got them spending money on food, education, and the emergence of mass consumerism. And not much else. Then we go along with Jagger in Generation X, and we get education, consumer goods, um, no haircuts, <laughs> conversation pits, and high pile carpets. Importantly, though, emerging in the 70s was the first oil crisis and the fright that we got from the 74 oil crisis. But it didn't last very long. It was just a warning sign. We then move into Generation Y and the Millennials, and this signifies a new time in our lives. Michael Jackson wasn't a musician. He was, of course, MTV, and the emergence of a new technology. So you've got the same things coming along, but we are adding to it the spend on technology, and then when we came to YTK, the upgrading of technology. That took you to Y2K. The oil crisis disappeared, and then suddenly life changed without us knowing it. Who changed it? Greenspan and Clinton. A major thing that we have to bring into what's going on. Because they took the line of stuff the responsibility of government to build houses for people, let the people borrow and build their own houses. And with that, life changed. We went from the 70s, the top TV soap being Archie Bunker, do you remember him? Talking about a gynecologist, okay? Well, that's the type of thing we were talking about, one guy living at home and bickering at his wife. If we look at the top image today, we are looking at a far different family, and that's married with children, for example. And the challenges that we are now facing governments worldwide over, how do we provide them with the medical scheme, unemployment benefits, other social security, retirement packages, and all the rest of it. And the line of government, they found a convenient way out of it. They said, stuff that. We've got no prospect of ever doing that. And there is an emergence of a new power, China and India, where we don't have to provide any of those benefits. We'll just pay them to build it in a sweatshop, and uh, we'll get somebody else to make it and outsource the problem of the elderly. So we did that, and off we went. 
What we didn't realize is that by creating China and a whole new force in the East, we have changed life as we know it. Because yes, we've got somebody else to do it, and, but what we get is that in the Gates generation, Generation Z, things start to change. We spend our money on education. Now emerging into it is wine factor. When are we going to the mall? When are we going to buy a new cell phone, a new computer, and a new car? 65% of cars today, the choice is made by the children, not by the parents. Who in their right mind would buy a Fortuna? But kids like them, so their parents buy them. Okay. Um, with respect to anybody who drives a Fortuna. And life at the mall and mall ratting became a big issue. You had technology and upgrading of technology, and then the costs of keeping your technology, which is the ongoing costs of cell phones, data contracts, upgrades, downloads, and all of those additional costs that have come into your lives in the last 10 years. Along with that came the want for property and more property. We were one property families 20 years ago, Today, many have got six and they can't get rid of them. And they are paying more and more out on rates and taxes. And that property has turned in your life from being an asset to a drain on your cash for the costs of keeping it. Then we enter the global credit crunch. So, putting it very briefly, we hit this thing at the end of the Mbeki era, three years ago now. We check him out, we put a new president in, we get a new minister of finance, and bang, it comes back. And we thought that there was going to be a quick recovery from the global credit crunch. Some spoke about it being a blip on a radar screen. It leveled out the recovery, but very importantly, in the last year or so, we have had a decline. So the global credit crunch, as we knew it in 2008, 2009, only lasted a mere nine months in South Africa that we were in recession. We came storming back, and government thought it was all going to be okay. So they said we will continue to grow at 3%, but they were wrong, because we started off okay in 2011, and then it started to decline and fall away. So we get to a position today that Jill Marcus from the Reserve Bank has said that we're going to grow at 2.8%. Lagarde from the IMF says 2.5%. And our Minister of Finance says, who's to argue with the ladies, will make it 2.7%. The important thing is, we haven't got the growth rates that we need to achieve Manuel's plan. It's one of the biggest flaws in Manuel's plan is, that's fine, we'd like to do all of those things, but where are the growth rates to drive that plan? We don't know. So what we are seeing now at the moment is that we are bumbling along at growth rates of 2 to 3%. Nobody is expecting any miracles going forward. We're not expecting a recession. We are con believe that we're just going to carry on bumping along. In fact, we found a correlation that proves that we will not have another recession. Um, and the correlation is between recessions and sharks milestones. Every time the sharks win a trophy, we go into recession. And they lost the other day. So that's okay. Putting this all together now, it has a result. The emergence of ma mass consumerism in China has driven the oil price from $20 a barrel in 2001 to $115, $116 today. And in rand terms, you are looking at growing from 150 rand a barrel to nearly 1,000 rand a barrel. This is not over, not by any means. Next year, in February, we're going to have to hear about what we are going to do with fuel taxes in South Africa. Because in this year, the increase back in February was only 28 cents a litre. And the reason for that increase being so low was that the Gauteng toll roads was due to come on stream. Unfortunately, that got stopped. So that was 5 billion, or 20 cents a litre, that hasn't been paid the whole year. When we go back to Parliament in February next year, Provin gordon has got to get that back, plus the 20 cents for next year if we haven't got toll roads, plus the inflationary increase. If we continue to see increased oil prices, together with the weakening of exchange rates, we could easily see 15 rand a litre 
within 12 months. And that is going to have a profound effect in where we are going. Last year, taxes increased by 5 billion rand by getting 20 cents a litre in increased oil prices. Next year, it's going to be a lot worse. What we are seeing with this is that inflation is back, and quite disturbingly, the education price index is rising currently faster than the consumer price index. And it is due to meet up with it soon. Well, not by much. And that's not your big factor. The big factor that has emerged in the last 10 years is energy costs. What you can see from the graph there is that up until 2007 or so, your electricity and fuel price increases were keeping pace with the consumer price index in South Africa. The red line indicates the consumer price index. Purple is indicating the petrol price. And blue is, of course, Eskimo. And we see that in the last five years, we have had a massive increase in energy costs. And nobody is predicting that this is going to slow down. And this is what's robbing the South African family of the excess cash that they have. Their returns that they're generating from their investments are a huge amount lower as interest rates have dropped off worldwide following the global credit crunch. So very important in the context of a school where a granny is picking up the education bill or a family trust, etc., their returns are one-third of what they were 15 years ago. That extra cash doesn't seem to be around. So when we go into the consumer confidence indicators that we're looking at, we see the recovery from the global credit crunch. It leveled off, but in the last year, consumer confidence has dropped right off. And post Marikani and all the other uncertainties that we're running into at the moment, the consumer has changed. No more is it play at the mall at a Saturday afternoon at a sports bar. Today we phone up our friends on a Saturday and says, who's still got a large screen TV that works and has got his DSTV paid up to date? We'll have a bring and buy at your place. And that's just the way that the consumer's going. So now when we put our personalities there, we say, yes, we've had the, the silent generation for 10 years. Can we wait for the silent generation to finish before analyzing out what we're going to see in the next generation? And I say, no. The rules for this generation have changed completely halfway through. So at 2010, I think we need to announce the Bieber generation. And we've got to look at what the Bieber family is going to look like and what we've got to do to work with the Bieber family. Okay, so they're the Biebers, and we've got to say a biggest thing that they've got to notice is that between the generation Jones and the Biebers, life expectancy has gone up, in the case of um, generally from 55 to 60, your life expectancy in 1940, to a Bieber draw, um, born today, we are looking at a life expectancy of over 100. That has an enormous impact on a family. Because when we look at Generation Bieber and getting it all from mom and dad and mom and dad rock and the whole emergence of wine factor and we'll carry on and shred our kid parents' trousers until we get what we want when you walk out of pick and pay, we're now saying there's a problem because every generation pays the education bill of the next generation. And we've done that through Generations Jones, Boomer, all the way through to the silent generation. But now we are moving into the Bieber generation. And parents have got to say, I'm sorry, I have got a problem. I have to provide for my retirement and for my in-laws' retirement. So we are looking at creating what's called the six-parent family, with two parents, a set of in-laws, and your grandparents all sitting in the same house. And the amount of disposable income is falling away. Because most of the baby boomer generation that are currently retiring are, have run out of money. And they're going to have to make an alternative plan. Also important in school finances is what is going to happen to grannies. Because granny's dad popped off, granny had the extra loot. She could pay for the grandchildren and settle their private school fees as we went along. But today granny is looking that. And she's saying, my interest rates are a third of what they were 10 years ago. And I've got a problem. 
I'm not going to pop off at 75 to 80. I'm going to live to 100. <laughs> so, uh, sorry about the bill payment this year and the bailout. I need that to secure my place in the Shady Pines old age. And this problem is aggravating every year. What it's doing looking forward is when we talk financial planning, we've always spoken about four phases of a suspension bridge. Getting educated in you know, zero to 23, getting started and buying your first house and your first TV, etc., etc., 23 to 35. And then spending probably 30 years accumulating a pension to retire on for 10 to 15 years. What is happening with that is today's parents are becoming the meat and the sandwich. Because we've got the parents in the getting started phase, but with their parents just on retirement, with insufficient money to retire, and the kids fleecing them for cell phone bills. And we're looking at this and we're saying, this is a fundamental change. This is where it's going. We've got to be careful about this. So if we look at the domino family effect, we are saying a family used to be domino one breadwinner and spouse, and three kids being money, more money, and even more money. But suddenly, as we emerge into the Bieber generation, we go and put on the top of that two sets of elderly grandparents. And when we put it back into the suspension bridge of financial planning, we are landing up with 0 to 23 getting educated as you did. But we never get to the accumulation phase because we spend another 30 years paying for everybody if you're a breadwinner. At 55, we finally got everybody out of the house. No, they come to you back from roads and they say, we're moving back in, Dad, and we're bringing reinforcements. And Dad says, what do you mean? No, I'm bringing my girlfriend with me. You know, that's the in thing to do today. But what happens is that the accumulation age starts at 55, then we hit early retirement at 60, and then they have to live for 20 years. And they simply don't have enough. So they're the meat in the sandwich, and we are facing a real strategic problem on this. Because if we go back to the dominoes, of course, if the breadwinner starts to spin, then of course the spouse spins, then the skid spin, and before we know it, the whole family's spinning all over the place. Okay? And then of course, <clears throat> one leaves, another dies, another drops out, another immigrates to Australia, and the whole social fabric of the family starts to come down. And we've got to say that we've hitting a changing time now, that we do have this question of the domino effect. We looked at education on the basis that people must get out there and build their own, become financially secure. The number of silver spoon people that will be left in this country is frighteningly tiny. If you look at South Africa's national budget for this year, it is one trillion rand. In estate taxes that they will collect this year, it is less than one billion. One thousandth of South Africa's taxes will come from death taxes. It's a tiny amount because nobody inherits anymore. It's all spent before we get to the next generation. That is a complete change from a hundred years ago when the Boer War was completely paid for on the British side by the death taxes of one British lord who died during the course of the Boer War. It was enough to pay for the whole thing. And what's worrying me in this is that as long as I've been involved in education, we have seen that the excess family wealth goes towards private school education. And we are starting to face a reality that it's simply not there. And if we get one domino disaster, we can wipe out a family. So now we go back to the Bieber generation and we say, how are they going to spend their money? They are going to do all the things that they did in the Gates generation. They can't get rid of any of those things. Um, properties you can't sell, cell phone contracts you can't cancel even if you want to, you can't stop your kids whining, you have to have food. But you have to put on top of that, that in the next generation, they are going to con be confronted by a massive energy bill, retirement and early retirement prospects, and looking after their own health care. If you think national health insurance is going to do it for you, we are 10 years of even impl preliminary impl implementation in South Africa, and they have got no way of paying for it. We would have to double the, the current health budget to even get close to it, 
Um, certainly, I'm not budgeting on ever standing in a national health queue. So um, you can take that wherever we want to go with it. So what we have to then ask the question is, if that's where the Biba generation's money is going to be spent, where is the discretionary spent? Where is the ability to cut back? And what's frightening me, and we are seeing the start of this at the moment, is the cutback, the obvious cutback, is on the education. Why? It's the easiest one to say, you know, instead of going to Rhodes this year, why don't I buy you an iPad? Why don't you self-educate? We are starting to see the emergence of more and more homeschooling. Why? Because it's cheaper. If one looks at it, and we take the fees of private schools at the moment, I looked on the websites for this lecture, tuition, 85 to 100,000 in senior school, boarding, 60,000 to 80,000, and then comes the rest of the shopping list that goes with an education today. And we've got to start asking some questions like this. Um, when you go drive past a private school on your way to work in the morning and you see what's driving there, and you start doing some sums, and we start asking some questions and saying, look, okay, the silent generation lived in a 4 by 4 What's it actually costing? Well, if you take a 400,000 Rand motor car, the Fortuna that we spoke about, and we drive at 25,000 kilometers a year, the AA calculator will give you 6 Rand 78 a kilometer, all in. That's your insurance, wear and tear, and everything else. And what we are finding that it is not uncommon for a family to live 20 kilometers from a school, have two return trips a day, 180 school days a year, 97,000 rands a year, true cost of getting a child to school. Now, nobody's going and put doing that sum and doing it like that. They're just saying, gee, the petrol price went up by X cents per liter. They don't realize when they see a Range Rover driving down the road, it's 12 rand a kilometer to drive that thing. And it's increasing at a staggering rate. And we've got to start saying, well, how many people can actually afford this? And can they borrow or see their way through? Or is this actually sustainable? And when one looks at the changes in it over a 30-year period, when I was at St. John's, extramurals were done in two rugby jerseys, one red, one blue, and two pairs of pants, one black for practice and one white for when you visit another school. Everything else was at the school's expense, from rugby balls to the whole lot. Clients, when they come to me and talk about their personal financial planning today, I say, where are you spending it? And they are saying, we are averaging one overseas rugby trip a year per child in senior school. And then there's the cricket trip, and then there's the rowing trip, <clears throat> My God, we've even presented the Coxless Force to Prince Anne this year. Well, we've done that. We've get on with it. Have a look at it. But how many people can actually afford that? So we say, well, who pays tax in South Africa? Let's find out how many wealthy people there are. And this is straight off the South website. We have 50 million South Africans. There are 4 million taxpayers. And the first million or so by number only pay 4% of the taxes because they are at the low end of the tax scale. In the category 120,000 to 400,000 rand a year, the middle working class is 50% of the taxpayers by number, and they pay 42% of the tax. But then if we look at super tax taxpayers, who would be our parent body, or people earning over 400,000 rands a year, we are finding that there are only 378,307 of them in South Africa. Less than one in a hundred South African is earning over 400,000 rand a year. But they're spending a huge amount more of that. And what we've got to say as we move up the scale is that we have very, very few taxpayers who can actually afford what we're doing. And we've got to say, well, is this going to get better? And the answer to that is um, maybe not. Because if we look at it, we are saying, how many dependents does the president have? So Zapira puts it like that and says, well, um, it's 50. And we draw other little pictures and say, well, we've got baby showers and all the rest of it. <laughs> but what we're not doing in all of this is we're saying, what does our country look like? And when you say to people, what does your country look like? They all produce a picture of Julius Malema. 
But we say that the challenge that we are up against and living amongst today is we say disabled people, 1.4 million, 3% of the population. Add 2 million AIDS orphans, 4% of the population. 10 million children on child grants, growing by a million a year. Then there are 8 million children who are not on child grants. There are more children on child grants than not on child grants. And we're getting up towards 50% of the population, particularly if we bring in 2 million old age pensioners, but they are dying as fast as they come on the system, so that number doesn't grow. So we're nearly up at 50%. And we've been looking after those people okay now for the last, um, since the Mbeki era, when we brought in all the social welfare grants. But the problem that we get today is what do we do with a child that is on a welfare grant? At 18, they leave school with a stuffed up education and a one in five prospect of getting a job within five years that will pay more than 4,000 rand a job a month. So they join the ranks of the unemployed, 4 million, and the ranks of those who have completely given up and are not even looking for work, a further 10 million. So we now get to a country where 75% of the country is dependent on somebody else in one form or another. When we then go and look at the actual breadwinners, we say, yes, there are 12 million South Africans with a job of one form or another be that a domestic worker or a flag waver or whatever it is. But the first 9 million of them sit below tax threshold. They are earning below 5,000 rand a month. So we're left with this tiny bit up the top. Then there is the middle class below super tax level, which I've put in this graph at 500,000 rands a year. That's 3.3 million more. And we say, well, how many big oaks are there? How many fat cats do we actually have in this country who can afford what we are offering? And per the SARS computer, we are talking 150,000 of them who are in super tax. That tiny little red sliver up the top. So we've got a problem with declining numbers and declining wealth at the top end of the market. But we don't seem to be doing anything about it. Then we have to add on to that the lifestyles and other issues that we should be dealing with. And when one looks at this energy thing, a very good way of measuring it and guidelines is to look at carbon footprints. And we find a child being trucked 20 kilometers to and from school twice a day is using up 4,35 tons of CO2 output a, a year just to get him to school. Then we have one overseas air trip plus two domestic air flights on rugby tours, another two tons. And if we have got a lifestyle that is not looking at CO2 uh, footprint, the average there is another five tons of carbon output per person. So we are looking on a lot of these people at being a carbon footprint of 11 tons per annum or more. And when one looks at the world average, it is 4.5. America, of course, well, they just carry on gassing, okay, 19. Africa, 0.86. Students are using 10 times their African brothers. China, 2.4. And the, what we are saying is we're running equivalent in our market to the OECD, OECD countries. And we are ignoring this, and it's going to start biting. Just come back from um, Cape Town where you hear of all sorts of new green initiatives. And the problem is that people are starting to look at you and saying, are you green? We've seen some of the wine farms in the Western Cape declare themselves carbon neutral and enjoy massive orders from overseas. We have seen other businesses that are energy inefficient who are starting to get boycotted by their customers. We can't ignore this either from a cost or from a carbon point of view. So we've got to say, well, okay, getting on to some discussion time in this lecture, what are the points to consider? We should be looking at carbon and cost awareness in everything that we do in every business, be that a school, a charity, or a listed company. Why is it that listed companies are in a position that they are now taking this extremely seriously and reporting on it? Other sectors of the economy aren't. 
There is going to be a school project very shortly. I'm sure that somebody is going to say, what is our school's carbon footprint and what are we going to do about it? They are going to publicize it. And then it's going to become a cane to beat you with. What is your school's carbon footprint? It's going to become very fashionable. People are going to start looking at it and they are going to start evaluating. Well, there's that anonymous saying, the most environmentally friendly trip is the trip never taken. And that might be very extreme. But, you know, um, none of us are very good at this. Uh, to get around the Eastern Cape, I use a great big Chev truck. It uses 12 liters per hundred. And by going to a hybrid car, I can bring it down to nine. Or maybe eight if I drive very slowly. It's not going to solve the problem. What we've got to be looking at is saying, well, we've got to say, we've got to cut back completely. Okay, um, and looking to reduce travel completely in our businesses. That is going to be extremely difficult. Um, the trip never taken, well, of course, the counter-argument to that was if we'd taken that line of work, well, then we would have had Scott of the Attic and never found the South Pole. But we've got to see how things are going to change. Boarding school is going to come back into vogue. We're not going to be able to afford to truck our kids around every day. If we've got a model there that says 97,000 rands a year just to run the vehicle to take a child to school, that's the price of private school boarding. Nobody is doing these sums yet. There's got to be a component of internet learning. There is a massive new requirement for this. The kids are identifying with it. And when I have Sunday lunch with my mom, she says, there's nothing to beat one-on-one -on -one contact. And I say, yeah, mom, but I can't afford to get to one-on-one -on -one anymore. She says, stop talking rubbish. But I think if the point stands. And could we go to a four-day school week, longer hours at school, with a day of homework working on the internet, where we can avoid the trip completely? Why? Because it's becoming more and more expensive. And the outlook seems to be, gee, we need to build more buildings at schools. And I'm saying, no, more buildings mean more costs of keeping them, more costs of energy to keep them going. Perhaps what we should be saying is that an iPad is replacing a building, if we look at it correctly. And a lot more energy needs to be going in this direction. And then we need to, I'm sorry, look at the business of saying these school excursions have gone too far, both from the cost point of view and from the CO2 point of view. These are hard realities that I think we are going to have to face over the last couple of years, over the next few years. We need to rewrite the book on how this whole thing is working. And um, some of you here might have remembered my dad when he was around in education at St. John's for 35 years. In 1974, the year of the oil crisis, he was sponsored by Goldfields, as it then was, to do a world tour to find out what sort of extramural activities we should be adding over and above reading, writing, and arithmetic. And he came back and he wrote a report on the social graces that should accompany an education at a private school. And I can remember this because he spent a lot of time in it. And 40 years ago, he wrote that we should be over and above in education, encouraging the following. Learn, teach a child to make a speech without losing his job, to dance without standing on his partner's toes, to march in a squad. Imagine that today. Play a hand of bridge without causing a fight, service a car without setting it on fire, use a typewriter, cook a meal without poisoning your friends, pour a drink without getting everybody sloshed, eat off an a la carte menu, and write a letter in a stylish manner. And we've looked at that, and post-74, in 1976 at St. John's College, we brought in what was then activities. It was two double periods a week where boys put on rugby jerseys and they had to go and learn to do other things, like give a speech. And that grew and grew and grew. And today there is a lot more of that sort of stuff going on at private schools. And we started with that back in 1974 at St. John's. If Dad was around today, 40 years later, what would he do? Now, um, that's where we take the idea for this lecture of saying, is it too late to rewrite the book? What will the social graces of a private school child be in 2014, 40 years later? 
And these are the, this is my list. Appreciating the realities and challenges still facing the new South Africa. It's all very well to sit out there today and post Marikani, we are doing this far too much. Carrying on there with basic when we behavior about our lousy lot in South Africa, but never offering to get involved. And not looking at the extent of the social backlog that still exists in this country and the challenges that we face today. I don't think that anybody knows about, about, enough about that. But then the next one that comes up also on sustainability is a basic course in understanding family, family finances. We used to live, I grew up under a basis of geld is most past the Dad must go and sit in his study till he gets it right. And we've carried on with that into the mass consumerism thing with, and it's basically parents say to me today, if I say no to my children, then I look like a complete idiot because their friends have got it. And it spins round and round and round. But we've got to start saying to people, you know, how much is enough? And, you know, we're fast going to, along a line where only Mark Shuttleworth is going to be able to afford all of this. Monitoring and reacting to your carbon footprint and energy costs in everything that you do. We are at the start of an energy crisis. Everybody says, you know, China will steam ahead. The world's okay. Well, that's fine. If China does steam ahead at growth rates of 8 to 10 percent, that will be fine. The world won't go into recession, but energy prices will increase. And that's where we're going to be on the receiving end of it. Effective home and internet learning. Not just go and Google something, but looking at programs that we can use using Vimeo, YouTube, and other things, together with assessment programs that ensure that we are actually teaching them something and that there is some type of feedback. Fascinating new stuff that we can get involved in. The food debate. We see in the paper today Tim Noakes now being criticized widely by the, all the cardiologists that he's basically the drinking man's diet doesn't work and you're going to poison your heart. And, you know, I'm pre-diabetic, and when I go into pick and pay, I cannot buy about 90% of what is on the shelves. Yet our kids are stuffing their faces with it, and what is the long-term effect of that on their health? Not so much from a point of view of, okay, um, it's not good and you might get pimples, but if you get sick, are we going to be able to afford the health care for an unhealthy child on an education? So look at that. We've got to look at healthcare and start teaching people earlier on in life, heart disease, diabetes, um, depression, and all the modern diseases that are associated with lifestyle. Going along with that is ways of evaluating the long-term effects of dirty habits. If you look on my website, I'll give you an address in a moment, you can download a calculator that will show to you that um, five dogs a day and two packets of cigarettes um, equals 3 million rand in a lifetime when up in smoke, let alone the knock-on effects on health, etc. And then very importantly is going to be entrepreneurship skills. I think that it is going the way of the California model, where the worst thing in life that you can have is a job, where today we work towards a basis where the entrepreneur is what we need because they can look after themselves and provide jobs for others. But what is the role of an entrepreneur in business today? And where are we going with business thinking? Certainly the bottom line approach that we looked at 20 years ago seems to have died. And we are looking at more socially responsible business practices. And people need to know about that. Number nine is going to be sustainable living with your parents and the elderly. Sooner or later, somebody's going to move in with you. What do you do with them? Nobody knows. But that is a life skill that we are going to have to learn to bring in and somehow um, add on to our lives, is the ability to cope with the elderly as people live longer and longer but haven't got the money to do so. And finally, and I think most importantly, the tenth objective is leadership for sustainability. People so ask, uh, often ask me, what is leadership? And I see that this evening you're having a whole leadership thing. I say leadership is anything where you are making a contribution. 
But what we see in King 3 report is the idea or the creation of the idea of leadership for sustainability. In everything that you are doing, you are saying, I am a leader if I am trying to create something which is sustainable. And we must be looking at that in all the businesses and all the people and all the families that we know and say that that must govern our lives. And that's why we've chosen it as the motto for our business school. Thank you very much.